that God works his models out of the living relationship with himself and that we should be careful to watch that relationship and not be stripped of it by even activity for the Lord that the relationship is the key so in the second paragraph he writes beware of outstripping God by your very longing to do his will we run ahead of him in a thousand and one activities consequently we get so burdened with persons and with difficulties that we do not worship God we do not intercede but just to show you the way that I operate I take my yellow marker and I mark worship and then I take it and I mark intercede and then I put one arrow going from worship to intercede and intercede back to worship to show the remarkable tandem connection between worship and intercession there, there is no intercession true intercession that does not flow out of worship and worship flows out of relationship and what he's saying is even the activity for God can steal the relationship and rob the worship and therefore leave you without an adequate intercession if once the burden and the pressure come upon us and we are not in the worshiping attitude it will produce not only hardness toward God but despair in our own souls and when I read that I thought wow that's just so much on with what has come to my attention the day before when my brother in Holland my key man in Holland um, to whom I had written to say uh, are you irritated or something are you, your, your, your last letter or so to me sounds very cryptic very short very terse very edgy and he said yeah he said I, I'm uh, I'm weak and um, I forget the words that he used impatient tired. tired weak and tired and he felt that he's being oppressed of the enemy and he can't wait for this thing to be over with which he's involved with me what kind of attitude is that so uh, he thinks it's the enemy probably in proportion to the importance of what we are about and so I said to him well you, you need to look to your devotional time probably you're sagging and being affected because you're not in a worshipful relationship with the Lord and therefore you're experiencing discouragement and weakness and so that's, this is what uh, Oswald Chambers is saying that if we lose that worshipful attitude it will produce hardness toward God and weakness and despair in our own souls um, in a certain historic way this is exactly what happened to Germany it experienced hardness to the degree that it lost its worshipful relationship with God and hardness is another name for cruelty what Jews experienced at German hands was hard it was a hardness of heart and a cruelty for that for which they were capable because they became hard to the degree that they lost the worshipful relationship that, with God that comes through relationship they lost that connection with worship and relationship that results in hardness and despair in our own souls and despair is at the root of Nazism there's a fancy word called nihilism which is the denial of everything it's the negation of everything it's a despair in which there's no hope for anything and you bring it down in a Gotha Damerung a, a final damnation of everything where the German cities are left in burning rubble that was the end of World War II where uh, Hitler was down beneath the earth in his uh, bunker while overhead the whole great capital city of Germany was in burning ruins have you ever, ever seen those pictures uh, of that city taken by air uh, at the end of World War II uh, the whole uh, year of mile wide areas there's not a building with a roof on it they're skeletons they're just gone that's the walls it, it was a complete devastation that's the consequence of losing that relationship 
and bringing hardness in heart toward others and despair in your own soul. That despair is at the root of Nazism and why they were capable of atrocity and annihilation and the devastation of Europe and finally of Germany itself. Then he says, God continually introduces us to people for whom we have no affinity unless we are worshipping God. Well, the people to whom God introduced Germany, for whom they had no affinity, were the Jews themselves. There was no natural affinity for the Jew. And the only thing that would enable you to relate to a people for whom you have no natural affinity is the worshipful thing that stems from that relationship with God. And if you don't have it, the most natural thing to do is to treat them heartlessly. So I wrote in the margin, history demonstrates that the natural thing that takes place that becomes heartless, when it's left too long, it becomes unnatural and ultimately cruel and bestial. You go from the natural inability to have an affinity with the people who are different to a place where you, it becomes unnatural and finally it becomes cruel and bestial. German history proves what Oswald Chambers wrote about before the advent of Nazism. And everything goes back to the loss that comes to man when he loses a worshipful relationship with God. A hardness in his own heart an inability to relate to those that are different and a natural revulsion that becomes unnatural and finally becomes bestial is the experience of modern times. And that's the nation of the Reformation. That's the land of Luther that lost it over a process of time. And um, worship is honoring God. I looked up the word worship in addiction. I'm not happy with what I read there, but it needs to be explored. But uh, worship is the issue of honoring God. Whether you do it in testimony, in praise, in song, in preaching, in witness, it's acknowledging God as God, as the source of all. And Cain and Abel is the example of a worship that was acceptable to God and a worship that was rejected. Worship is sacrifice. Cain's sacrifice was not acceptable to God, and, and the Abel's was. Matthew Henry says the way that you can know it is that God consumed Abel's sacrifice by fire and left Cain's sacrifice unattended. Isn't that remarkable? Because one was authentic out of a worshipful heart was a worshipful sacrifice, a worshipful offering that recognized God as the source of the blessings that had been received and was paying homage to the God who provided it. And God found that acceptable. But the word Cain means performance, production, uh, self-sufficiency. He gave only a scant nominal acknowledgement of God as a religious kind of obligation like paying his dues, and God did not consume that sacrifice. It was not acceptable. And the proof that his heart was wrong and that his heart was hard was that he got angry. Cain became angry, so angry that he finally murdered his brother, whom he envied because God favored him and accepted his sacrifice while he spurned his own. The fact that he could be angry both against God and against his brother unto murder shows that he had not a worshipful heart to begin with and he could not relate to someone who was different God continually introduces us to people to whom we have no affinity and unless we are worshipping God the most natural thing is to do is to treat them heartlessly that's what Cain did to his own brother he treated him heartlessly. It was the first murder. And it's related to a failed worship that is related to a failed relationship that was not worshipful. See how remarkable all this is.
God was not honored because he was no longer seen as the source of German prosperity, but industry, commerce, state, and education, the work of their own hands. Cain means acquisition, getting, production, <coughs> possession. And Abel's name means futility and vanity. Isn't that interesting? One emphasizes human attainment, and the other name means non-attainment. It's, it's, it's weakness, it's foolishness. It's saying, without God, I can do nothing. If there's any increase, it's come from God. And I honor him because I recognize he is the source. Germany lost connection with the source because it was prospering by its own hand, its own industry, its own military, its own system of education. They lost the relationship with God. They lost a worshipful relationship. They became hardened in their heart. They could not relate to those that were different to Jews in their midst. They became unnatural, and finally they became cruel, and they became bestial. That's exactly what Cain became to his own brother Abel. And at the end of the age, how does God separate the sheep from the goats, the Cain people from the Abel people? How do you relate to your brother? When did we see you naked, thirsty, and hungry? If you have not done this for the least of my brethren, who should be your brethren, you have not done it unto me, and therefore be sent into the fire prepared for the devil and for his angels. They are the people of Cain. Not to be able to, to relate to your brother is the whole issue of the, of the relationship to God. In the last days, they cannot even recognize the Jew as their brothers, let alone be gracious to them, even in a natural way. See me? The issue of the brother, recognizing the brother, and being merciful and gracious rather than hard and unkind, is the issue of the relationship to God. That's why he can tell at the end of the age who's with me, who's against me, who's Cain, who's Abel. Who goes into the fire? Who goes into the kingdom prepared for, for sons? This Gerhard von Rad, the German scholar, says, Responsibility before God is responsibility for one's brother. Remember what Cain's, after he had murdered his brother, the Lord said to him, Where's your brother? He said to Adam, Where are you? But to, to Cain he says, Where's your brother? He says, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer really is, exactly. You're the older brother. You're the firstborn. You should have been watching over him. You should have been protecting him, not murdering him. The issue of your brother, your, your attitude and relationship to your brother, is the whole issue of God. Responsibility before God is responsibility for one's brother. Isn't that remarkable? Killing a brother... That's, that's the way the age begins. And, and Seth replaces uh, Abel. And from the time of Seth and Seth's children, people begin to acknowledge the name of the Lord. It begins real divine history. And th then, they, then the Bible gives the genealogy, and Cain is completely omitted. There's no reference to Cain. The spiritual history begins with Seth, who replaces him. It's interesting that when Cain is born, Eve says, I have produced a man. When Seth is born, she says, God has appointed. Seth means appointed. Cain, I have produced. Cain means produced. Getting. Acquisition. Power. She said, I have produced the son with the help of God, which is just a little crumb, you know, for God. It's a religious piety. But she, I have produced. But when Seth came, she says, God has appointed for me another child instead of Abel because Cain killed him. So to Seth also a son was born and his name, he named him Enosh. And at that time, people began to invoke the name of the Lord. Spiritual history begins 
with the replacement for Abel. And I don't know if I'm being very fanciful here, but if you see this as a parable or a, a kind of a design, Abel died at the hand of a murderer in order to make way for a Seth with whom the real spiritual history begins and at, w at which time the people begin to acknowledge the name of the Lord. So you can almost say that Abel is a picture of present Israel that needs to be brought to death in order that it might be replaced by a Seth who is appointed and who will bless all the nations who will call on the name of the Lord. That, th that though Cain is the instrument of the devil and is heartless toward his own brother and is capable of murder, something like the apostate church today, something like the apostate God-rejecting world will be the instrument of bringing down present Israel unto death. And God will replace that with, with the nation that's appointed by which nations will begin to call upon the name of the Lord. So the Lord's design is fulfilled even through the death of one brings the birth of another. But I just encourage you to uh, look at this first uh, murder. It's a remarkable statement and it has it goes back to the issue of worship. Worship is offering, worship is sacrifice. One acceptable and blessed, received by the Lord, and the other rejected. Because the other was nominal, religious, cursory, an obligation, something convenient. Because Cain uh, gave from the fruit of the field. He was a farmer. He gave what was accessible Abel took the best of the firstlings of the flock. He gave the best of the flock, and he gave the fat of the firstling. Fat may be to us uh, repulsive, but to God, fat is the accumulation that comes from rest. See what I mean? Uh, fat is a statement of a devotional uh, dependency and rest upon God. And that he found that acceptable, his fire consumed it. Cain's was a sacrifice of convenience that was at hand, that he could give, but it cost him nothing. It was not a real honoring or an acknowledgement that the source of his prosperity had come from God, because Cain was a tiller of the ground. He labored. He was a possessor. And Matthew Henry says that probably these two sons, these two first sons, had a choice in their vocation. One chose to be the tiller of the earth and produce, because that's what he was, while the other chose to be pastoral and to watch over the flock, because that is a devotional occupation. There you sit with the flock, and you have much time to reflect on reality and truth in God and develop a relationship that could become worshipful. Isn't that a remarkable insight? And it was a choice. Abel chose to be a pastor. Abel chose to be a shepherd. And he recognized that the increase came from God, and he gave him the homage due him as true worship. Isn't that a beautiful story? What these sons represent and the conflict between them eventuating in murder and the attitude of Cain when he's confronted by God with the question where is your brother am I supposed to know what, what am I my brother's keeper the insolence of that the audacity to talk to God like that shows that it's a man who never had a worshipful or even a respectful attitude toward God that when he's confronted with his sin he lashes out with a, a lie I don't know what am I, my brother's keeper? So he's a liar and a murderer like his father. And the Lord had pleaded with him, you know, sin is at the door. Yes, your, your offering has been rejected, but if you do right uh, uh, and 
sin will not consume you. It's at the door waiting to act out what you have already set in motion. If you don't watch it, what you've done in this nominal relationship with me that hardens your heart will t turn to your brother as murder. And the very next thing we read is, Cain took Abel out into the field and murdered him. After God's warning of what would happen unless you amend and change your ways, he still remained angry. What, what a picture this is. And, and induces his brother to come out in the field that he might murder him. How did he induce him? He probably lied to him or flattered him or gave him a false encouragement in order to do him in. On the heels of God's warning that sin is at the door and it will capture you. It's wanting God's acknowledgement and acceptance on its own terms, on what it produces, and fails to see the grace of God in the field as well as in the flock. Because God calls us to worshipful service. We remembered, uh, was it yesterday morning, Romans 12, 1 says, Make of your body a living sacrifice, which is your appropriate worship or your appropriate service unto the Lord. Everything should be worshipful, whatever the sacrifice, whatever the, uh, the labor, whatever the activity, and should come out of a relationship as unto the Lord. And that's something that um, Cain failed to obtain. And it's the danger, it's the thing that befell Germany. They produced also out of themselves the leading economy and military power of Central Europe and it almost brought down civilization. And it hardened their heart. It made them angry. It made them unnatural. <laughs> Everything goes back to true worship that God is waiting for. And true worship waits on relationship. So, I'm just appreciating what the Lord is opening in this. And Cain was the first one. And yet God's favor that should have been with the firstborn who inherits everything according to the biblical mode rested on the secondborn it's something like uh, Jacob and uh, Esau again Esau was the firstborn but God's favor does not, did not follow the propriety or the uh, mechanics of men he chose what he would choose so the attitude of the older brother toward the younger even like the prodigal son and the older brother showed a resentment and an envy and an anger in each case and the inability to recognize the grace of God on the other brother because your relationship with your brother is relative to your relationship with the father if you have not an adequate and right relationship with the father that's worshipful how shall you recognize the brother so therefore the brother is the litmus test of your relationship with the father and that's why when did we see you naked thirsty and hungry when did we see you in the least of these brethren? We didn't see you as the father. We didn't, and therefore, how can we recognize the brethren? Though they said, Lord, Lord, I've never known you. And be, be cast, therefore, into the fire prepared for the devil for his angels. The sheep and the goats, the Cain people and the Abel people are the two categories that remain at the end of the age. And it's the issue of Israel that identifies them. And there'll be no, no other category we're moving toward one or the other. So this issue of worship is so enormously important. And we've been turned off from it because it has become a commercialized thing. It's become a production. Worship teams, worship leaders, uh, music amplifiers, or, as if music is worship. It can aid worship, but it is not in, a, in itself worship. Worship is an attitude. Worship is a relationship. Worship is an honoring. Worship is an acknowledgement. And that's what he's talking about. You lose that, you're going to get tired, defeated, despairing, and hard. Germany is the national statement, and my brother in Holland is a personal statement, but it's a threat to all of us. So that's why when we, we had these, these little pregnant sounds, I said, you know, this is an opportunity to give a testimony. That's worshipful. To sing a chorus, that's worshipful to share the word of the Lord. That's worshipful. It's not music only, but worshipful things are acceptable to God that flows out of a worshipful heart 
that's in a worshipful relationship. You shouldn't have to be prompted to give a word of testimony to the Lord. See what I mean? If you're in a worshipful, able place. See, Abel chose to be a shepherd. He chose a vocation that would give him opportunity for devotion. Because you're with the flock, but what do you do? You're sitting like David, and you're playing your lyre, and you're composing your worshipful courses in your psalms. <laughs> I chose to be a teacher, for, not for the least of reasons, that it would give me occasion to read. I wanted to be a teacher because I knew it would require reading and study. So I chose a vocation that would implement my desire. And that's what Matthew Henry is suggesting. It's, it's, it's just a conjecture, but he's saying that these two brothers, see, this is the beginning, and these brothers are prototypes. One chooses this, one chooses that. One has this kind of disposition toward God, the other has another. One, you know, I think of that phrase, that their souls were made lean. When you have a lean soul, there's no fat. You know? See, fat has taken on such a pejorative meaning in our generation. We want to get rid of it. We die it. But I'm trying to communicate it in the biblical Old Testament sense of why when, when God smelled the sacrifice of the fat, that was for him the sweet aroma. Because it was a statement of a spiritual kind. It was a symbolic kind. But if you give a sacrifice without fat, it means you're giving the most rudimentary thing that is more the product of your sweat than the product of your devotion. Abel gave what was the product of his devotion. You see what I mean? He was a, medit a meditator. Uh, Isaac was a man of the tent. Jacob was a man of the tent. Uh, that, that's a picture of a pastoral life that finds time not to be so busy that it cannot seek and communicate with God. In our natural bodily life, we don't want to accumulate fat. It's not healthy. And it shows improper diet, lack of exercise, lack of discipline. But spiritually speaking, we want to accumulate it. We want spiritual fat that comes from waiting on the Lord devotionally. You know what I mean? To, reckon, to see the the difference between the natural meaning and the spiritual meaning. But isn't it interesting that the Egyptians despised the Israelite occupation of being sheep herders. It was the lowest form of employment from the Egyptian perspective. To be a, a, a watcher over a flock was in, in, in the in sight of Egyptians the lowest of all occupation. And maybe later on in Israel that when God chooses a king of all of the sons of Jesse he takes the one who's the shepherd because the shepherd is the, is the devotional one or has at least the, the potential and the opportunity for devotion you know the story of uh, when we lived in Israel and I, in Carmel in the Galilee Heights I got up in the morning I wanted to go up and find a time with God and I had to go through brush with thorns and thickets and climbing my way up. I, my legs were just bloody. But it, I finally found a rock. And the sun was just coming up over the horizon. And I'm wanting to wait upon the Lord and to be before Him in this undistract. And as the sun came up and the heat came up with it, the first thing I saw were the droppings of the sheep. All around that area. That's where the shepherds had taken their flock. And because of the droppings, there were the flies. And because of the flies, I was beginning to get nipped. And I, I got, my legs were getting like swollen places. I finally had to leave. And my little bubble was burst of the idyllic devotional time that I thought I would have alone up on the mountain top. So it gave me another perspective. It said that David followed after the sheep. He had to walk through their droppings and fight off the flies, the thickets. This devotional life is not a snap. This is not some little sugar candy thing. That's why God respects it. It's a God-honoring thing because it requires persistence. Because it's not ease. It, it, it requires a heart that's willing to find the time and to keep persistently at it.
before God because you recognize him as your source. He's, your, he's the blessing. It's the Lord who gave out of the Proverbs a statement for the black community in America and gave the occasion to speak it. And the fire of God came down that day on that sacrifice. He consumed it. The people were beside themselves with, with applause and with... <laughs> but the, because I knew, and he knew that I knew, that he was the giver of every good and perfect thing that comes down from above. My attitude was an able attitude, not a Cain attitude. It wasn't something I produced. It was something given out of a devotional relationship, and the fire of God fell on it. The same thing happened in Nuremberg, Germany, with that message on true and false repentance toward the Jew. May, may there be more fire falling on what God uh, honors because he knows it's born out of sacrifice and out of relationship with himself. So let's, let's just pray along those lines and the thoughts of the Lord for us. Naomi? Because righteousness is, is the impartation of what God himself is. And impartation takes place in relationship, in union, and union in relationship. Abel evidently found time for it. And his prime time. If he gave his chief sacrifice, the firstling of his flock, and the best of it, it was a statement of what had been characteristic of him all the time. His first thought is always God. His first giving is always God. That's worship. Worship is the acknowledgement of God as God first. And then you give the first. See what I mean? You give the best, not just what is convenient for you. Brother is the litmus test of what the, uh, the truth is of our relationship. And we're going to say to Germany that the Jew in your midst for 2,000 years was your brother. What? These, this people, they're so different, they're strange, they have side curls, they, they wear black, they're, they're not like us, we're Germans, we're civilized, we're blah, blah, blah. They fail to recognize their brother because they were different. <laughs> they, were, they were the least of his brethren. They could not recognize them as brothers. They could not extend themselves to the brother that the Jew was to the German and killed him. They could not save him so they killed him. They could not be to, to, to the Jew in the midst, the older brother, and show them, the, and show the, the younger the way of the Lord. And, and what you cannot save, you ultimately destroy. What you cannot relate to naturally becomes unnatural. I'm gonna, I may be speaking this in Germany. Lord, uh, give me grace, because one of the things that we're already learning is some reaction already from the German edition of the Holocaust book. We're, we're a wounded people. How did, how did this woman say it uh, about Germany? We're wounded and, uh, lack and we lack a national self-esteem. It's interesting that when God gives Cain his judgment, he doesn't kill him. He makes him a wanderer over the face of the earth. And he says, this punishment is too severe for me. He, he didn't think a moment's mercy of his brother, but when he has to pay the price and punishment for it, he's full of self-pity. I'm wounded. I need my self-esteem. You're going to make me a wanderer, and I'll be a candidate for, people, for others to murder me. What a picture. Of, it sounds so much like Germany because they have not acknowledged that they have murdered their brother. They have not acknowledged the Jew as their brother. Am I my brother's keeper? Germany would say. So Lord, we just uh, thank you for what you're fingering, what you're touching, what you're sounding. What was at the beginning is such a foreshadowing of what is coming at the end. When did we see you thirsty and hungry? When, when did we recognize these as your brethren, let alone our brethren? And so, Lord, we, I'm asking that you would uh, impart deeply an understanding of your heart in all of this, 
There's a reason why you were so sparing in Genesis, why, why you're so terse in your statements and so compact that it has to be opened. And I pray, Lord, that an opening will come in the sharing of this word, in Germany especially, and places where it pleases you to bring us, that worship is the name of the game. Worship is not a little icing on the cake. It's not a little... Um, aspect for Christian services to make them warm or and enjoyable it's the heart of the whole matter and we pray Lord that our own worship would deepen become every day more authentic and real more acceptable in your sight that you might take it to yourself and consume it by fire it would be a sweet smelling savor it would not be the expression of what is convenient for us and what is at hand for us that we can do that, that we have produced but the acknowledgement by God that everything comes from you so help us in this Lord we thank you for this precious rich theme and if in any way there's a pattern here that Abel had to go even through death violently imposed by an apostate brother in order to make way for the Seth who is given and appointed which is the picture of Israel in its millennial glory that will move all nations to acknowledge the name of the Lord then establish this Lord in our understanding and in our speaking this great mystery thank you Lord for your thoughts this morning may they find lodging in our hearts and affect our own attitude our own walk our own relationship Whatever our occupation is, may we find pastoral time. May we find and seek devotional time uh, that, that, that gives you the primary first place and, and not an afterthought. Thank you, Lord. Or else our hearts will be hardened. Or else we'll become tired. Or else we'll become weak. Or else we will not be able to relate to those who are different from us and for whom we have no affinity in a natural way we, we will become unnatural and we thank you for, for what Oswald Chambers has seen and shared and the precious record in scripture Lord that corroborates thank you Lord. let not this word pass from us 